what you might want to do is uh, Google me. Uh, and then you'll get all the information. It's not totally correct, but about 90%. So, um, so I'm not going to go into you know, where I come from and who I am. Simply, <coughs> it is true that I was born in Paris of a French mother and a Russian father who was the son of emigres who had fled uh, Soviet Russia. There wasn't yet a Soviet Union. Soviet Russia back in 1922, my father was 14. His parents emigrated to Berlin and to, to Paris, and there he met my mother. Um, and he worked for MGM in Paris, Metro Golden Mayer. She worked for Paramount. So the movie connection brought them together, and that's how I appeared. <coughs> And we lived in France, and then uh, during the German occupation, uh, we fled. My father was a Russian Jew. What's more, very pro-Soviet, not a good combination as far as the Nazis were concerned. So we got out via Marseille, and then uh, Spain, Portugal, and to the United States. And I basically grew up in New York City. Uh, and uh, I guess my formative years, to a very large degree, were there. And then, uh, for a variety of reasons, one of which was the, uh, the worsening of relations after the war between the Soviet Union and the United States. And my father was a Soviet citizen. He'd taken out Soviet citizenship. Um, he lost his job. He was blacklisted and uh, ultimately was offered a job by the Soviet government in what was then occupied Germany. In, the Eastern sector, that is the Soviet sector. There was no uh, German, uh, there was no Federal Republic. There was no German Democratic Republic yet at that time. That happened a bit later. And so we moved to Germany and that's where I spent the next four years of my life, hating every year, every minute of it because I hated the Germans being a, a wartime kid. And uh, then finally we moved to the Soviet Union and pretty much that's where I've lived. Um, the rest of my life, although I worked seven years in the United States in the 90s, and I've traveled a lot. And as uh, Sharon said, I have, I, uh, I'm a citizen of three countries, France, uh, the United States, and, um, and, so, and Russia. So basically, that's it. That's, and you can look it up in detail. What I thought would, might be the best thing would be for you to ask me questions, because, I mean, I can go on about the Soviet Union, Russia, what's happening now, Putin, what have you. Uh, and that may, may or may not be uh, of interest to you. <laughs> and I think that if you ask concrete questions, um, I can be more precise and handle them. So what are, it, to whatever you prefer, Sharon sent me a list of questions. I don't remember how many. Not really that many. Uh, less than there are people here. Um, but um, it's, your, it's your choice. If you prefer to ask questions, we'll do it that way. If not, I'll try to give you a, a picture of what's, um, what's happening now in Russia, why it's happening, and, um, and why we have the problems we have between the two countries, of which I'm part of. So, what do you prefer? Yes, you know, I prefer the background. Okay, fine. All right. Yeah, okay. <coughs> Um, the first thing, you know, you, uh, you've probably heard and read about the fact that uh, Putin has said that the, uh, <coughs> um, the disappearance of the Soviet Union uh, was a tragic event. And so thereby people say, oh, he wants to go back to those times. A lot of people have put it that way. What he was saying in reality was that 25 million Russians who lived in what had been the Soviet republics and then became independent countries, no longer part of Russia, suddenly found themselves in foreign countries, uh, cut off from their relatives, and really not having anywhere to go because in Russia proper, they had no jobs, no homes. So suddenly, overnight, 25 million people were no longer in their own country. Psychologically, that was quite a blow. 
You also have to keep in mind that the overwhelming majority of Soviet citizens were patriots. You know, you got the picture sometimes reading Western, reading the Western media, that everyone was a dissident, and everyone was dreaming of the day when finally there would be no Soviet Union, no Communist Party. <coughs> Sadly or not, but that's not the fact. The fact is most people <coughs> were patriotic. <coughs> Excuse me, if I could get some water at some point. <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> and for them, especially for the Russians, now let's keep in mind that the Soviet Union was a multi-ethnic country, uh, much more so than the United States in the sense of, in the United States, everyone's American, let's put it that way. In the Soviet Union, everyone was Soviet, but Ukrainian, but Georgian, but Kazakh, but Russian, and very much attached to this land, which had been theirs for centuries and centuries. They didn't come from anywhere. That's where they'd always been. This had become part of an empire, the Russian Empire first, and then, if you will, the Soviet Empire. It doesn't matter what you call it, but this was where they lived. So for the different republics, the idea of being an independent country was something very attractive. But for the Russians, it was their country. They were the major uh, ethnic group. And suddenly, uh, their country loses chunks here and there. The Baltic republics, the republics of the Transcaucasian republics, the, um, the Asian republics. Uh, psychologically, it was a blow. It was a blow. And I think, I don't think, I know that that's what Putin was referring to when he called it a tragedy. So, uh, it, we should also keep in mind that by the end of the 80s, a great many people were disillusioned with what was going on in the country. Brezhnev was a man everyone made jokes about. He was kind of looked down upon as a, as a quasi-idiot at that time. I mean, one of the most well-known jokes was uh, he comes to work and his aide says, oh, but um, Leonid uh, Ilyich, as he was called, you're wearing one brown shoe and one black. You should go home and change. And Brezhnev says, well, at home, too, there's one brown and one black. <laughs> yeah, it's that kind of thing. Um, so, and then there was disillusionment with the promise. Because the promise that had been made of what this country would be uh, was simply not, never came true. And one of the great stories is about a man coming to a, um, an outpatient clinic and saying to the nurse, I want the eye ear doctor. And the nurse says, there is no such thing. There's a doctor who looks at your eyes, and there's a doctor who looks at your nose, throat, and ears. But an eye ear doctor doesn't exist. No, he says, I have to see the eye ear doctor. So they argue back and forth, back and forth. Finally, she says, look, there is no such doctor. But if there were one, why would you want to see him? And he says, well, because I keep hearing one thing and seeing something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> and that was pretty much the feeling that a lot of people had. There was a, a feeling of disappointment, if you will. Don't worry about that. Thank you. I don't want you know, going to feel like I'm drinking vodka or something. <laughs> <clears throat> so when everything changed under Gorbachev initially, and it was still the Soviet Union. We're talking 18, 1985 when he was elected, and then <coughs> when he um, initiated perestroika, glasnost. This is 85, 86, and things really began to change very radically. Uh, many people were, were, were um, um, full of hope that, that finally the promise that had been made way back in 1917, the promise of socialism with you know, equality for all, no rich people, but no poor people. Everyone has access to every other. This, it's a pipe dream, but nonetheless, a very nice one. And those people who had great political power during the Yeltsin period, I'm talking about the 1990s now, right? They no longer have that. But that was taken away by Putin. In fact, he called them, he was elected, uh, appointed, call it what you will, in the year 2000. And, uh, in, in 2002, I think it was, he called in. He, he had a meeting with all those oligarchs. And he said, basically, look, we know how you made your money. You can keep on making it. 
but there's one condition. Stay out of politics. Stay out of politics. Don't finance parties. Don't support any political groups. If we agree to that, no one's going to touch you. Otherwise, you're going to have problems because we know how you made your money. And all of them said, deal, including Khodorkovsky, a name you probably know. But he kept on doing what, what he was not supposed to do. He supported several different parties financially, including the Communist Party, by the way. And finally, Putin called him in and said, look, we had an agreement, didn't we? And Khodorkovsky said, oh, but I'm, I'm doing exactly what you asked me to do. I'm not, you know. He tried to, how should I put it, fool Putin? Well, what happened was he was arrested, spent 10 years in jail, and it was a lesson more for everyone else even than for Putin. Watch your step. Don't do what you're not supposed to do. Uh, democratic? No, certainly not. But Putin is not a Democrat. Let's not fool each other. So <clears throat> the people, the average Russian, for whom money was really never that important because money couldn't <clears throat> buy many things. You couldn't buy a house. It wasn't allowed. You couldn't have a yacht. You couldn't have a private plane. It wasn't money that determined your status. It was who you were, rather. Member of the Communist Party, high-ranking official. That was different. But money in itself, it gave you certain comforts. You couldn't travel. You couldn't travel in the Soviet, go out of, out of the Soviet Union. Very few people could. And so the attitude towards money was um, one of, well, yeah, it's something you have to have, but that's it. <coughs> and there wasn't much you could buy in the Soviet Union. And then with the economic changes that took place, suddenly everything was available. I mean, like in New York City. Uh, just anything you want, it was there, provided you had the money. And some people had it. And most people didn't. And that created a very profound rift in <coughs> Russian society, which is still very much there. Uh, there are these immensely rich people uh, who flaunt their riches, you know. And then there are most people who, well, in Moscow, I'd say uh, life is better than in most other places. But when you travel in Russia, you'll see a lot of poverty. Um, when you travel in America, you can see a lot of poverty. And there is a difference, for me at least, and that is America is so much more wealthy than Russia that I find it hard sometimes to understand why you can have these pockets of real poverty in such a wealthy country. That's a different, different story. Okay? <clears throat> um, during the Yeltsin period, 1991 to, to the year 2000, the relationship between Russia and the United States was a pretty good one, at least formally. Why was that? Well, because Russia did exactly what the United States wanted it to do. Yeltsin never said no. Never. Americans came in and pretty much, well, they were going to teach Russians um, <clears throat> how to run their country. Teach them the, um, uh, the ABCs of economy. Um, there had also been a promise made <coughs> by Secretary of State James Baker to um, Gorbachev. And that was, and now this is official, there's a document that confirms this uh, in the National Security Agency in the United States, Washington University, so you can look that up. Uh, James Baker said to, to Gorbachev, if you take down the Berlin Wall, and if you allow the two Germanys to unite, I promise that NATO will not move one inch eastward. Now, <clears throat> this was not in writing, but it's there in the document. It's a quote. This was very important for Russia. Ru the Soviet Union and then Russia has always seen NATO as an aggressive bloc. It's always called a defensive bloc. Nonetheless, 
the way the reality of it is that for, for Russia, it's been an anti-Soviet, anti-Russian military organization. So the fact that it would stay put and not come closer to Russia's borders is very important. And that's the way it stayed until 1996, when Bill Clinton decided that they would increase the membership of, of NATO and take in three more countries, Hungary, Poland, and the Czech Republic. Now, there was a big argument going on in the United States about this. Secretary of Defense Perry retired because of that decision. Uh, there were two views. What do we do with Russia when there's no more Soviet Union? One view was, look, we should try to do the same thing that we did with Germany after the war. See to it that the communists don't come back, that fascism doesn't arise. So devise a kind of a Marshall Plan, but don't just give them money, but aim it like a laser, you know, and see to it that this develops towards democracy, keeping in mind that democracy never existed in Russia, not in Tsarist times, not in Soviet times. It's a country that never had democracy. So it's something, it's a learning process. You can't decree democracy. You say, all right, as of now, we're a democracy, because in here, we're not democratic. It takes time. So that was one view. That's what we should do. And the other view was pretty much uh, well expressed by a man by the name of Paul Wolfowitz. I don't remember if you remember his name. He was Deputy Secretary of Defense for Policy. And his view was, now that we are the only super um, state, if you will, we should keep it that way. We should tell our allies not to develop their military forces, that we'll take care of that. And we should see to it that Russia does not come back. And in fact, we should punish Russia. 40 years, they threatened us. Well, they should pay for it. So there were these two, and you can look that up, the wealth of its doctrine, it's called. So um, the, there were two, two of these views about how to approach um, Russia. And ultimately, it was the wealth of its view that prevailed, which led to Clinton's decision uh, to um, enlarge NATO. And from there it went to a bunch of other countries. And now there are several NATO countries that are right on Russia's border, which Russia sees as a threat. Much as I think the United States would see as a threat any kind of Russian military organization, say in Mexico or in Canada, wouldn't allow it, right? Okay, so that's when the relationship began to sour, 1997, 1998. Uh, then the bombing of Yugoslavia. Now let's recall that the United Nations organization didn't allow it. So NATO decided to do it on its own. Now let's not kid each other. NATO is the United States. Sure, there are other countries involved, but you know, let's face it. The 800 pound gorilla is the United States. They decided to bomb uh, the Serbs. Because of what was going on in Yugoslavia, the Civil War, whatever, um, Yeltsin pleaded, don't do that, please. Let's find a political solution. Basically, what he was told was, look, shut up. You lost the Cold War. You're no longer a big country. We don't care about you guys. Just sit in your corner, and that's it. Uh, and that's when I think that the, the Russian leadership began to understand that the United States has absolutely no intention of improving relations, that that's not the aim, that the aim is different. Two years later, Yeltsin retired. He was sick, he was drinking, and the people who made them for him were the oligarchs, one of whom, a certain Boris Berezovsky, who I knew very well, decided that you know, they were looking for a man who could replace 
Yeltsin. And they found this man by the name of Vladimir Putin. Not a big deal, really. He worked uh, for the mayor of St. Petersburg. He was one of his deputies. Yeah, he'd, he'd, been, an, he'd been a spy, so, you know, so what? Um, nothing really outstanding about the man. And, and um, Berezovsky felt that um, he could use him, uh, that he would be a puppet in his hands. Big mistake. <laughs> and so that's how Putin basically came to power. And I'd like to point out that when Putin came to power in the year 2000, he asked NATO for permission for Russia to join NATO. This is official. It's on paper. He also asked for the, po for the possibility for Russia to join the European Union. So clearly a westward-looking policy, becoming part of this. And what was he told? <coughs> no way, Jose. Uh-uh. It's not going to happen. Because you're too big, because you're too this, you're too that. So that was the first kind of you know, getting it on the nose. Um, and gradually it became very clear that you know, you, if you want to have a good relationship with us Americans, you better do what we tell you. Because today the world is unipolar. We are the big ones. And everyone else is going to be pretty much following what we do. Um, in the year 2007, now this is the second term, the second term of Putin's presidency, in Munich, um, addressing the, uh, what was then called the G20, Putin basically said, enough. Russia has its own interests. This is not a unipolar world, this is a multipolar world. We have our national interests as you do. We will no longer dance to the American team. We will follow our own policy. From that moment, he became the bad guy. There was no Ukraine, no Crimea, nothing of the sort. This was, he, had, he was telling, basically he was telling the United States, go to hell. Look, and you don't do that. And that was when Putin became the bad guy, and he's been the bad guy ever since. That's when the rift really began. And that's when um, the, the relationship became somewhat akin to what was happening during the Cold War, but more dangerous. Because the, clo the Cold War was very clear cut. You had two camps. The West, headed by America, <coughs> and the socialist world, headed by the Soviet Union. That was it. And so they called the shots. Now you have a real mix. And anything can happen. And it's very hard to predict. Back in those days, there were a couple of instances when computers uh, told the people watching them that the other country had launched a nuclear attack. And yet there was no um, counterattack because there was enough trust to doubt and to check the computers before, and, and you have only 10 minutes to do that, by the way, um, before taking that decision. Uh, the danger of uh, an accidental war today is much greater because the level of trust is much lower. Nobody trusts Trump. Nobody trusts Putin. So if the computers say they've launched an attack, bang, you're going to get uh, a reply, and that's the end of it. That's the end of the world. So that's where the real danger is. It's not the danger of a, um, a decision to go to war. It's more uh, the danger of a, an accidental war because of the relationship today. Um, I, 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 don't, I never like to predict. Most people who predict always get it wrong anyway. Um, so I can't tell you where this is going. I'd like to think that uh, somewhere down the road, enough people will realize that 
things have to change. Not because we want to be friends, but because we want to survive. It's much more important. You know, friends, not friends, okay, that's fine. But uh, we're talking about survival of our countries and not only of our countries. And the policy that is being followed now by both sides are, in my opinion, suicidal. Uh, I think there's enormous stupidity, lack of understanding, in fact, no desire to understand. Uh, American leadership has no idea of what Russians are about. Russian leadership has no idea uh, about, about America and what makes it tick. And there's no desire to know. The more you put pressure on Russians, the tougher they get. So the pressure that put has led to them supporting Putin much more than they would have in other conditions. You know, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Well, that's pretty much the Russians. Um, without this understanding of the other side, it's very hard to reach any kind of, of agreement. And that's not being done. And that's why I think that um, uh, the exchange of, of, of just regular people, and not only regular people, is tremendously important. Um, sadly, uh, not that many people are involved in this. I mean, if, if I had my druthers, I'd try to get 10,000 American kids to go for a year to Russian schools and 10,000 Russian kids to go for a year to American schools, and every year a new 10,000. And after five years, that would be 50,000 on both sides, and that would begin to impact, because they'd see things. It's not that they would say, oh, I like this, but it would be, oh, I see. It would be that kind of reaction. That's not happening, sadly enough. So basically, that's the background that I can deliver at this point. And um, I'm with you until uh, maximum noon, and then I have a flight to Berlin, my favorite city. <laughs> so please. Okay, sir. Well, thanks for that excellent overview. Uh, I'm a retired Army officer, still a Guantanamo defense attorney. And in the course of uh, that, uh, being a Guantanamo defense attorney, I had to do a lot of research into the United States. How did we get to a point where we're having a totally extra legal, unconstitutional, illegal uh, prison system like at Guantanamo? And, uh, and that research led back to the end of the Cold War. And coming to realize that at the end of it, like you mentioned, Wolfowitz, you had the draft defense plan and guidance of 1992, which is the Wolfowitz doctrine. Yes. And then became official as our 2002 national security strategy. Right. And uh, so, number one, I want to thank you for informing people here uh, of this overview, because uh, my frustration is Americans are in such abject ignorance of their own country and their own country's foreign policy. And again, take it, you know, as an anti-communist, anti-Soviet activist and, and army uh, member in the 1980s uh, and, and was student of low intensity conflict. So I guess my question is, uh, you already talked quite a bit about NATO and, and the, their expansionism, but uh, in the United States, we've really created this, or in our media, I'll ask you for a comment about them, created this hysteria along with the Department of Defense of gray warfare. Uh, and you know, pointing to uh, Russia as the practitioners of great war warfare, but totally ignoring that the United States, and here we can have some pride if you want, we are the best at great war, maybe other than Israel. And so, uh, you know, we, we have this constant focus on Russia attacking our democracy, and we ignore what our own CIA, Joint Special Operations Command, is doing around the world, interfering in every other country's election when it suits them, like Yeltsin. Uh, so my question is, can you tell me a little bit about how Russians and the Russian defense establishment sees the accusation of them being the right. great okay. warfare? Thank you. Okay. Um, the um, the, the story of Russia trying to impact uh, U.S. elections, <clears throat> uh, supporting, um, supporting Trump and uh, trying one way or another to, uh, to make it more difficult for Hillary Clinton to be elected, 
um, is seen by most Russians, the vast majority of Russians, as being a lie. But that's what they're told on television, by their press, by their president. And most people believe what they're told. Whether or not there was an effort on the part of Russian hackers, and whether or not Putin knew about this, is something I'm not prepared to say one way or the other. I don't know. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. Of course it is. Is this a two-way street? <coughs> of course it is. But there's one important <coughs> difference. The Americans will say, <coughs> yes, but we do it for a good cause, and you do it for a bad one. <coughs> and if you look at it that way, then there's no answer. You know, we're the good guys, you're the bad guys. End of story. You can't compare, therefore. Um, and basically, that's it. Uh, one thing that, that Russians ask me, they say, look, the ones who are interested, because not everyone is, they say, look, Hillary Clinton got three million more votes than Donald Trump. How come she's not president? So what I've got to do is explain the Electoral College. <laughs> and that's something most Americans don't know any, much about, really, you know. And why was it created to begin with? Now, there's a reason for it. You know, the, the Founding Fathers were not stupid. They're not, they weren't all Democrats, but anything but stupid, you know. So it's a very arcane thing, this, this uh, Electoral College. Uh, and that's hard to, uh, uh, but what I, the fact that she got three million more votes simply proves that the Russians weren't very successful in swaying American <laughs> opinion. And I was, you know, American propaganda, generally speaking, uh, is not very sophisticated. Uh, the best propaganda is for people who, who uh, advertise goods. You know, sometimes you get some incredible, uh, attractive, interesting um, PRs. But generally speaking, propaganda is not very effective, uh, except when you're addressing your own people. It's one thing when you're addressing another people because it's a different mentality, and you don't quite know how to talk to them. But when you're talk talking to your own people, American propaganda is very effective in depicting Putin as he is, very. And Russian propaganda is very effective in showing, in depicting American military or whatever and so on, because that's when you're talking to your own people. Finally, about this whole war theory thing. Some of you may or may not remember, many years ago, there was a magazine that competed with Life. It was called Look. It was the same format. Now Life is smaller, then it was a larger magazine. And in one of the issues of Look, Dwight D. Eisenhower, upon retiring from the presidency, well, retiring, did it eight years, wrote an article about the military industrial complex in the United States, warning. Now, he was a man, he knew what he was talking about, right? I mean, this was a general who'd been the supreme commander and who also was president for eight years. He was warning about the dangers of the military industrial complex in the United States the power it was assuming, and what was driving it, huge money. There's a military industrial complex in Russia. Also huge money. And that's really where it's all coming from. There is an interest, an interest, not in war, because war is going to destroy everything, but there's an interest in military industrial production. Uh, because it's more money than, than oil or drugs uh, or prostitution all put together. And that's something very few people are looking at. And every time I think, I mean, here's a man. I mean, you can, Eisenhower may not have been the most brilliant uh, uh, man in the world, but he certainly knew what he was talking about. And that's kind of been pushed under the rug and forgotten. And it should be recalled. Yes, sir. Boy, are you easy to listen to. Well, thank you. Would anyone give you to express it? Uh, I do a lot of speeches about the point of view from Russia. I have been doing that, and I've got a lot of schedule ahead of me. I need some precision from you, because my press says something I'm not sure about. Please. 
which is Putin's, excuse me, Trump's approval rating while he was running for office was 66 percent. It has now fallen to 16 percent. How accurate is that, or not accurate? How? How accurate is the Russians' perception of of Trump today? Dropped from 16 to 16. First of all, they. It's not something that most Russians even care about. You know, it just isn't. They care more about, uh, you know, what Putin's uh, rating is. And you know, who cares about Trump for, for Russians? And the attitude towards Trump is not really all that negative. There, uh, there's an attitude of kind of, of condescending, um, misunderstanding uh, how sly the man really is. Because when they say he's crazy, he's crazy as a fox. He knows exactly what he's doing. Uh, more people more involved in politics are afraid because he's, uh, you can't really predict what he's going to do. And he may do something totally unexpected and very dangerous. Uh, but most Russians really don't care you know, what kind of ratings he's got. So what? You know, America is not at the heart of Russian interests. It used to be. America uh, used to be this country that really attracted attention uh, during the Cold War, especially during the Kennedy period. Um, and then the, gradually that kind of went away. Uh, yes, ma'am. something about when, when Putin asked if Russia, if the Soviet Union, um, no, I'm sorry, if Russia could join NATO and the EU, and the U.S. said no way, Jose, and then you said at a certain point Putin said go to hell, and you said you can't do that, that was a mistake. So I'd sort of like you to elaborate on whether it was legitimate for Putin to say basically no way, Jose, as well. Clearly, I think that he really had no choice. <clears throat> he I, either had to accept the American view or say no. Even the Chinese, who are much more sophisticated in dealing with other countries, even they've had to, at a certain point, say no and see what's happening. When I said you can't do that without without consequences. Uh, not wage, but buying power has gone down by about 13%. It's become tougher. But again, when, the, when your average Russian realizes it's because, not because of Putin, see, but because of the United States, it completely changes the view. OK, we can take that. We can stand up. We've gone through much tougher times, you know, the feeling is. So you're not going to get us, and so on and so on. So it's like playing to the wrong kind of sentiment, because it arouses not just pride, but uh, dislike, sometimes hatred, nationalism, you know, we're, you know, we'll show you. Not the kind of relationship you want to have. Sir, you, you had a question? Yes. Yes, I wonder if you could speak to the uh, demonstrations uh, in Moscow, the weekend demonstrations. Yes, <clears throat> absolutely. <clears throat> One of the great differences between the Russians and the French is that demonstrations for the French are part of life. You do it every day, whenever you need, and so on. And <laughs> in Russia, you never do it. And the reason you never do it in Russia is because you're going to be punished. It's a scary thing. You don't go out in the street unless, unless you're ready to shed blood. Uh, part of democracy, certainly, is being able to express your views through a demonstration. Uh, and that is something that the leadership in this country don't yet accept, and probably will not. One of the really, if not the, the biggest problem in this country, 
is that the leadership, the entire leadership, political, economic, is Soviet. These are all people who were born in the Soviet Union, went to Soviet schools, were members of the Young Pioneers, of the Young Communist League, of the Communist Party. They are a product of a society that no longer exists. They were made by another society. Now they find themselves in a completely different society, but they try to run it with the mentality that they have, and they're not doing a good job. But there's nothing you can do about that. What do you do with these people? The only thing that you have to wait. The, the, the kids who are today 18, 17, they're the future for this country. They're completely different. There's always a difference between us and our children, but not that kind of a difference. They're a completely different, um, their outlook is completely different. They've traveled. They've been able to, they have the internet. They've been able to read books that were banned in those years. They've been able to watch movies that were banned in those years. They have access to things that their parents never knew or had any idea even about. They're the ones who are going to change this country if we live that long. Um, so when people now go out in the streets, these are mainly young people, and they're seen as provocateurs by the leadership. What do you mean you're demonstrating? You shouldn't, why do you do that? You're not allowed to. We don't allow you to. And these kids say, well, we don't care if you allow us to or not. We're going out. <clears throat> the wonderful thing is that the fear is gone. This country used to be run in part by fear. Certainly in the Tsarist years, certainly in the Soviet years. Fear was, there were two things that held it together. Faith and fear. And gradually, first faith and then fear disappeared. There's no more faith now at all, because there's no ideology. And fear is still there for the older people, but not for the kids. And so I, first, I support these demonstrations, but to give you just an example of how things have changed, the fact that I'm saying this to you, that I support those demonstrations, and had I been in Moscow, I was abroad, I would have been there, see? If I would said this in Soviet times, there'd be people waiting for me downstairs. Uh, there's been a, a, a sea change in this country. And so when you go and when you travel and when you look at it, you have to remember where it's coming from. Don't compare it to the United States. It's a completely different story. It's a different story. You can say, well, why don't you have the same story as we do? Well, I'm sorry, we don't, you know? And that's it. You know, it's like, uh, what was it, Pre Professor Higgins in, uh, in My Fair Lady? Why can't a woman be more like a man? Well, you know, she can't, and that's it. And if you don't like it, it's just too bad. Um, so, yes, uh, ma'am, yes. We're here because we do want to prevent war. And you have lived in both cultures, you know both cultures. What would you suggest we do? Well, you're going to travel, right? And you're going to see a lot of things that will surprise you and perhaps even shock you. Depends. Um, my, my advice would be, and I, you know, I'm, I take upon myself a uh, more than I should when I say I, I'm going to advise you, <clears throat> is try to get to the bottom of it. If something surprises you, try to get to the bottom of why, why does this exist. Talk to people. You'll find that Russians are very straightforward and willing to talk. Um, and I think that should you succeed, I'm not saying you will, Should you succeed in, in understanding people here, who they are, what they are, and why they are? I think that when you go back home, where the picture of what's going on here is completely different from what is actually the truth, I think you just tell your story. What else can we do? You know, we're just, I can do much more because all right, I'm a journalist, 
I'm international, I go on television, I speak to people. But basically, what can we do except tell people the truth as we understand it? Because there isn't one truth. It's much more complicated than that. Uh, but I think that when you're talking to a person and that person realizes that, that you're honest, and we all are pretty good at feeling that, you know, and it, that this is not a con job. Or it's, you know, um, that's, all, that's what you should do. Because, <clears throat> um, first of all, that's all we can do. And secondly, it's a question of the, the general atmosphere. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about, what we're dealing with. Before the G7, you know, the G7 uh, assembled recently in Biarritz in France, and a few days prior to that, President Macron invited Putin to Paris yeah. because Russia is no longer a member of the G7, but he wanted to talk to Putin and kind of get a conversation going, and the fact that he was doing this just before the G7 was kind of a symbol. Right? So, how did the French press react to that? Um, there's a um, very well-known uh, newspaper called Figaro uh, that the Sunday edition has a magazine. And so, the magazine came out with this, and it says, the Russian spies are back big time. And you have Putin, and he's wearing goggles. On one goggle is the United States, the other is the European Union. So on the one hand, our president is inviting this man. And here's who he is. And this is quite effective, you know, this kind of thing. This is France, which is a much less ideologically motivated country than the United States. If you were to look up, um, uh, covers of American political magazines with Putin, you'd be surprised. At some of the, you will not find a single Russian political magazine with any kind of picture like this about any president. It just isn't done. It was in Soviet times, but not nowadays. And this is typical. This is the way you poison people's outlook. You're not saying Macron should not meet with Putin. No, no, no. You let him meet with this guy. Okay? Do we like that? Are we happy? Yes, ma'am. And I did Google you before coming. And <laughs> one, and one of your interviews, uh, and I don't remember what year, but you spoke of the role of mainstream, respected mainstream journalists in spreading propaganda and admitted that mainstream journalists do spread the line or have done that in the past. And I think in the United States, Talking to people about a different point of view on Russia is very difficult when they get most of their information from CNN and MSNBC <coughs> and the New York Times and the Washington Post, and they are spreading propaganda. Right, right. So, as a journalist, what do you do? How do you? How do you? How do we address those issues? You know, I um, was a huge admirer of American journalism. Huge. And uh, there was a time when I think it was probably the best in the world. Um, I was a close friend, and still am a close friend, of Ted Koppel's Nightline. Um, I knew a lot of those people. Uh, I remember a day when um, Fred Friendly, who was then a professor of journalism, took, brought together uh, a group of outstanding American television journalists. And um, I was included because I was doing a show with Phil Donahue, and Donahue, you know, big name, so I was there. Um, and he said, gentlemen, I want to ask you a question, and I'd like to get an answer as quickly as possible. Let us imagine that you're interviewing the Secretary of Defense, and you're in his office, and the phone rings, and he picks up the phone, says, yeah, okay, yes. He hangs up and he says, excuse me, I've got to go out just for two minutes. He walks out. So you're sitting in his office, and naturally, you look at what's on his desk. You don't touch it, but you look. And you see that he's left a document there. He should have turned it over, but he didn't. 
Now, it's upside down, but you're a journalist. You've learned how to read it upside down, right? And you read this, and what it says is that your country is going to declare war on another country in 10 days. And this is no joke. So then he comes back. What do you do? Question. What do you do? And there were about 15 of us. And it took us about 30 seconds to unanimously say, we will do our damnedest to make this public. It's our, it's our duty. It's not for us to decide whether it's good news or bad news or not. We are duty bound to make this public. Because nobody asked the people whether they want to be sent to war. Nobody asked whether they'd like their husbands and their, their brothers and their sons to be killed. They should know this. It's our duty. It's like a doctor on the field of battle. If he sees a wounded person, he doesn't ask, are you a friend or a foe? If he does, he's not a doctor. Now, that would no longer be the case. In Russia, when I, I did the same thing, I got together. Not one said that. Everyone said, try to figure a way out so as not to say anything. Oh, yeah. Said, well, it wouldn't be patriotic to make that public. Oh, yeah. And I, and I said, what do you mean patriotic? Is a journalist a patriot? And how does that work? Is he going to decide what news is good or what news is not? There were some people who very honestly said, I'd be afraid. And I said, that I can understand. One said, well, I would ask the Secretary of Defense. Said, Go ahead, I'm the Secretary of Defense, ask me. Uh, and I would say, well, Mr. Secretary, um, there have been rumors to the effect that um, our country might attack uh, this other country. Could you um, answer that question? And I would say, that is a lie. We are a peace-loving nation. We want nothing more than to have good relations and so on. And then I'd say, but I saw that document. And I would say, all right, bring in the police. Let's hold this, <laughs> bring, hold this guy for 10 days, OK? Uh, because there's, there's never been uh, journalism, journalism in Russia. Again, it's a new experience. So how do I work? Well, to be very frank with you, I walk on thin ice. I know that Putin doesn't like me. He does respect me, but he doesn't like me. But the idea is not, how should I put this? It's not about who you are. It's not about showing, oh, look at what I've done. It's about caring for the people who are watching and listening to you and seeing to it that they think. Um, I don't think a journalist should keep telling people what he thinks. This is good, this is bad. That's not your job. Your job is inform. Give the picture as broadly as possible. Be as honest as you possibly can. Don't lie. Absolutely. Tell the truth as far as, you know, as your capacity to. And let the people make their own decision. Nowadays, there is no such journalism in Russia. Well, exactly. And so, in my opinion, there's been a, I won't say journalism is dead, but it's, it's in a very bad state because here uh, the main, even opposition is propaganda. It's propaganda the other way around. Everything the government does is bad. So, you know, it's, it's the same thing, but um, uh, here there is no tradition where in, in America there is a great journalistic tradition. And it's too bad that uh, nowadays mainstream media um, in both countries um, are controlled in Russia by the government, directly or indirectly, in America by the big corporations. How do you know Putin was told. Well, in 2004 I went to see him, actually. He was then a different kind of Putin. Um, and um, he received me. I mean, he was you know, president of Russia. And I wrote a letter saying, I'd like to talk to you. And by God, you know, I was in the Kremlin for an hour talking to him. Wouldn't happen now. Uh, but a friend of mine, well, actually, Putin's press person, a guy by the name of Peskov, 
who's a friend of a friend of mine. And this friend of mine asked Peskov, he said, how does Putin feel about Posner? And he said, well, he's got, um, he's not all that happy with what Posner does, but he does respect him. That's, you know, that's for whatever it's worth. <laughs> yes, sir.